and I fell into this magazine, wow. And uh, as I said, the magazine collapsed after two issues. But I realized something very interesting was happening. And that is the comic magazines, as we called them in those days, didn't call them comic books, were being produced by the publishers who had been publishing the pulp magazines. Now, pulp magazines were dying at the same time. As a teenager, he just had a sense that there was an opportunity there. Um, he dismisses it as being particularly brilliant. He said anybody who was there could have uh, seen the opportunity. He said, uh, one time he said, uh, it was raining and I had a bucket. So he started this business. I picked up the phone and I called Iger and I said to him, meet me downtown, I got an idea. So we met at a little beanery around on 43rd Street between Lexington and 2nd Avenue. And I said to Iger, look, it's very obvious that these guys are using daily comic strips to fill their magazines, but there are only about 50 or 60 daily strips in the whole country, of which maybe 50% of them or 30% of them are adventure strips. I have an idea to start a studio producing original material. Well, he said, it's going to take money. He said, I don't have any money. I said, look, I figured it out. I know where I, we can rent a, an office for $5 a month. It's on 41st Street and Madison Avenue on the corner. I've just sold a commercial job. I had about $10, and my father loaned me. He had another $5 that he could loan me, enough to pay for three months' rent. He was about 13 years older than me, so he knew his way around. And I said, you're a businessman. You can go out and do the selling, and I'll produce the work. We agreed that then the company would have called Eisner and Iger. My name was first because I was putting up the money. Well, we're leaving the restaurant. The check came to $1.90, and I had $1.95 in my pocket, which meant I had a nickel left to get the subway up to the Bronx. So I paid the check, and we walked out. And as we were walking down the street, he turned to me, and he said, you know, it's not very nice. He said, you didn't leave a tip. <laughs> so from then on, he said to me, you know, you're a very tight-fisted fellow. So we opened this office, and he went out and began selling these pulp magazines that were pulp publishers who were looking for comic books. Uh, let's go back to Eisner and Iger. Okay, okay? great. Because that was really where we first met, where we got started, both of us got started yes. there. Eisner and Iger in those days, I know I was hiring at, uh, at a, you know, anybody I could get who could draw, we were, we were desperate for at the time. In the studio at Eisner and Iger, Iger Eisner and Iger had about 14 or 15 artists working on salary full-time. Uh, the guys who came in early into the business were those, first of all, who were ashamed to even say that they were working for comic books. This was completely and totally a junk medium. Magazines like Collier's and Saturday Evening Post, who had the top illustrators and artists working for them, were slowly being phased out. And other kinds of publications were coming to the fore so that the artists were really looking, some of them were really looking desperately for work. One of the places that they could pick up work, easy stuff, was in comic books. What uh, Eisner and Iger did, and what a few other people at the, at the same time did, was actually get the young artists in the room. So you find guys who have very little training and are young and will work really cheap. You get some cheap office space and you, you line them up, and you line up a job. You get some pulp publisher or someone who wants to try a comic book, and he says, I'll pay you this much to give me 64 pages of publishable comics, and then it's the job of this bunch of kids to produce those 64 pages, and you figure out who does the neatest lettering, um, who does pencil art better, and who does ink art better, and who can actually make up a story that makes sense, and who can make up good names for characters, and you just, you just kind of pass it around. Well, I guess I, I was impressed that Will had gathered so many talents who later became very talented, you know, including Lou Fine and, and others who worked in the studio. I didn't realize he was that much of an entrepreneur businessman at that time. And Will would uh, walk up and down the aisles of this bullpen, basically telling these other kids, say, redraw that, do this, do that. Uh, I admire people who know what they're doing. Uh -huh. I felt that you and Jerry were those kind of people. Anything you told me to do, I, I would have done. 
because I felt that I was learning something. Mm -hmm. I wanted to learn how to be good so I could never go back to that ghetto again. Sometime in fall of 39, sure. Lizzie Arnold and Henry Martin called me up. Henry Martin was a registered Tribune, and they said, we want to do a, a comic supplement. It was called a ready print in those days, and wanted me to produce it. And Busy said the condition was that I produce it independently. This was at the latter part of 39? Early 39. Surprising to me. Summer, th summer of 39. Yeah. I was then partners with Jerry Iger, right. and Eisner and Iger. Studious. I realized it would be a conflict of interest. I couldn't do that. Busy Arnold and Jerry Iger were not very close. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. I uh, understand. But it wasn't purely a personality question. Busy Arnold uh, was, had a partner, the, the syndicate. And they made a condition that it was not to be done by a commercial shop. It had to be done by an individual, because the syndicate thought that way. Right. So I'm, I struck a deal with Busy Arnold, and I said, I will, under no conditions will I come unless we form a deal. I would form the partnership. I would own the strip. And the fact that he had uh, ownership in the spirit was also pretty much unprecedented. You can count on, you know, one hand the cartoonists who owned or were able to acquire the rights to their own strip. So again, uh, in his early 20s, he had enough foresight to say, I'll do this, but I want equity in it. Most of us did not know anything about rights, percentages. We didn't, we didn't come from that culture. You know, if we had come from, uh, I think the editors knew more, because most of the top editors came from the pulps. So they certainly had more of a business sense of the value of art and story. But most of the, uh, myself and the colleagues who started in the comics uh, were naive about that. Many of us, it was the first time we had sold our work. When Siegel and Schuster sold Superman to DC, or let's say had, D had Superman published by DC, they uh, reportedly got a check for $130, which was $10 a page uh, for 13 pages. And it did not include anything any payment for the rights. It was simply payment for the pages. And there was an implication that in buying the pages, they bought everything that was in the pages, include, you know, including the intellectual property and the copyright. And many of these guys, including Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster, were just storytellers. They wanted to make things up, draw pictures, get their names in print, and make a living at it. And unfortunately, in the process, laid themselves wide open to exploitation. Anyway, I went to Iger and I said to Jerry, look, we had a buy-sell agreement. Either you buy me out or I buy you out, but I have to, you know, I want to go off and do this thing. Jerry said, you're crazy, there's no future, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It may not work. At any rate, it wasn't a toss of the coin. Jerry said, I'll buy you. So I sold Eisner and I Iger got it. to I got Jerry. It. I gave it to him cheap because I, I didn't care that I was going into something that I felt was, was worthwhile. Because by then, I had realized that, for me, this was going to be my life's work. One thing that Will told me years ago about how he was looking at Milton Kniff, at, uh, at Terry and the Pirates, and wistfully wishing he was better than, or at least as good as that. Not sure that he was, but sure that he was better than all of his comic book compatriots. He had to find a niche somewhere between the two. And so he invented a comic book that could be sold with the newspaper, finding a newspaper audience to uh, see what he could do better than anybody else, which is to take advantage of the fact that each page of a comic book is a surprise that hides the page after. So that the uh, fertility of Will's imagination could find a platform appropriate to it. A kid was most likely to buy a comic book. However, newspapers went to homes where parents and children both read them. And I think he felt enough adults would pick the spirit out of that pile if it was a good read. I think he wrote to that audience. He stopped writing to the 14-year-old in Iowa, and he started writing the spirit for an adult audience.